Thank you very much, Jim. And it's, uh, it's extremely exciting to see so many people here. Um, and it's a great pleasure and, and honor to welcome Professor David Harvey to the Penn Humanities Forum. David Harvey is unquestionably one of the leading scholars in the humanities today, and certainly one of the foremost social theorists working within the Marxist tradition. Uh, if I may share with you a brief confessional moment, I, I want to say that his work has been a, a great inspiration and source of instruction for me, but also something of a vexation. Um, I've just com completed a book on post-Marxist theory, and whenever I turned to David Harvey's work, I felt that the whole premise that somehow Marxism uh, had suffered a fatal blow was shaken by the rigor, the, the, uh, the rigor, the comprehensiveness, the vitality, and the urgent relevancy of, of David Harvey's work. And any time one looks at his work, uh, one also sees that he destroys any facile cliches about leftist dogmatism. In his hands, Marxism becomes a supple tool of analysis, and his work becomes a model instance of the possibility of combining passionate engagement with cool level-headedness, utop utopian optimism, and balancing realism. David Harvey is the Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He received his PhD in Geography from the University of Cambridge in 1961, and geography has remained his primary home discipline throughout his career, even though he's been extraordinarily wide-ranging in his work. He taught for many years at Johns Hopkins University. He returned to England uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s uh, to serve as a professor at the University of Oxford. Uh, and then in 2001, he took up his present position at CUNY. He's the author of far too many books to begin listing here but I would feel remiss if I did not mention a few, The Limits of Capital in 1982, uh, The Condition of Postmodernity, 1989, A Brief History of Neoliberalism in 2005, and most recently, The Enigma of Capital and the Crisis, uh, yeah, The Enigma of Capital and the Crisis of Capitalism, which appeared in 2010. When Jim English and I planned this series on adaptations, we felt uh, it was crucial to address the theme of capitalism. After all, capitalism is nothing if it is not adaptive. Indeed, if the theory of evolution has sometimes been pressed into the service of the analysis of capitalism, it bears remembering that, in fact, Charles Darwin's breakthrough idea of competition came from reading Thomas Malthus, a political economist. There is no shortage of praise for the adaptive capacities of capitalism. Neoliberals would celebrate these as signs of capitalism's power of innovation and growth, and possibly nothing less than the expression of, hum of the human spirit's imagination and yearning for improvement. From the vantage point of neoliberalism, what Joseph Schumpeter once called creative destruction has often been celebrated as the positive, triumphal power of capitalism. Yet even for Schumpeter, who was no friend of, of, of socialism, creative destruction was at best a very mixed thing, ultimately for him threatening uh, the very survival of capitalism. And more distantly, reaching into, the, into a more distant uh, history, it's important to recognize that creative destruction, in fact, is a central idea, if not phrase, in Karl Marx himself. After all, Marx writes in the Communist Manifesto, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. David Harvey has restored the idea of capitalism's creative destruction to its proper place in a critical theory. He recognizes the inseparable relations between capitalism's dynamism, its instabilities, and tendency toward periodic crisis, and also its efforts to manage these contradictions and crises. As a ge geographer and urbanist, Harvey has written pioneering inquiries in both, into both the spatial and temporal dimensions of these processes. In tracing capitalism's continuous efforts to overcome the limits to profitability, he has described, for example, a time limit, uh, a time space compression in which increased speed of turnover, innovation of ever faster transport and communication, 
and flexible accumulation drive an ever more frantic pace. Likewise, he has analyzed the urban space as a spatial fix for periodic crises of overaccumulation, seeing in the built environment a mechanism that absorbs huge amounts of surplus capital. Questions of spatiality have also fueled Harvey's theory of globalization. Globalization, in Harvey's view, can be seen as the ultimate form of time-space compression. Globalization allows capital investment to move instantaneously around the globe, devaluing fixed assets and laying off labor in one urban conglomeration while opening up new centers of manufacture in other more profitable sites of operation. Globalization, in this view, does not resolve capitalism's crises and contradictions, but merely moves them around geographically. Contra Thomas Freeman, Friedman, Harvey's globe is not at all flat, but it's very uneven and it's very shifting. Space matters in this analysis, not only to capitalism, but also to the resistances that capitalism provokes. We invited David Harvey to Penn months before the Occupy Wall Street movement began. Clearly, the Occupy movement highlights the urgent need to interrogate the meaning of space in capitalism. Space not just as a medium through which capital flows or becomes fixed, but also space as, an as the indispensable site of contestation. In a recent piece on Occupy Wall Street, Harvey underscores the movement's rootedness in what might be called the most basic tactic of, dem of democracy, and I quote, to occupy a central public space close to where many of the levers of power are centered, and by putting human bodies there, convert public space into a, public, into a political commons, a place for open discussion and debate over what that power is doing and how best to oppose its reach. Close quote. The capacity of this tactic to provoke those at the levers of power is more than clear in the stunning willingness to employ force, even if that force is dressed up in a language of concern for cleanliness, hygiene, and public safety. So I won't say anything further. Uh, we have a uh, very provocative title this evening, The End of Capitalism, with, the, uh, with a question mark. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Harvey. So uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, I'm, you're, you're frustrated. I've been frustrating a lot of people. I recall back in the 1990s, I was told that Marxism was dead. And I, I said, well, actually, I think I'm still alive. <laughs> and and uh, since then, I've been riding up a storm just to prove them wrong. Uh, and. Um, it's been a rather great experience. Um, I'm not quite sure where the title of this talk came from. I, I, I'm not sure I gave it. <laughs> um, maybe I did. It was a little while ago, and you know, one of those euphoric moments. I said, "Oh, you know." Uh, but it immediately tracks me back again to the middle of the 1990s when I first heard the, the commentary that. Um, uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And uh, I heard it from uh, Donna Haraway at that time, and since then it's been attributed to all kinds of people, you know, so where it originated I have no idea. Uh, but uh, I think it's worth uh, thinking about it, and I thought, uh, you know, since it was easier to talk about the end of the world, I'd, I'd skip this capitalism bit and talk about the end of the world. <laughs> Uh, and you then feel much more reassured. Uh, but uh, there's something serious here which uh, I, I did think I'd like to reflect upon, and so when I saw the title I thought, well, maybe I should think about this, which is why is it so hard to imagine an alternative to capitalism? What is it that's happened uh, that puts us in a situation where it seems there is no alternative? And when I say there is no alternative, of course, I'm thinking back to the woman who coined that phrase, which is Margaret Thatcher. And she said, there is no alternative. And she set about 
trying to prove her point. And Thatcher, I think, is a, a, an extremely interesting figure uh, for precisely this reason that she said, I'm not simply out to you know, change the way the economy works and you know, crush the unions. And, well, she didn't say that, but you know, I mean, that, that was what she was really saying. Change the institutional arrangements. She said, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really out to change the soul. I'm, I'm really out to change the way in which people understand their relations to the world. Uh, and I am out to change the conceptual universe in which people live. And it's very interesting to look right now, and this struck me very, very forcibly um, just recently when I was in Chile, where one of the other heroes of neoliberalization, General Pinochet, uh, operated, where actually you realize that while Thatcher is no longer active in the scene and Pinochet is gone, Pinochetism, if you like, still rules in Chile big time. Thatcherism rules big time. That actually this idea that there is no alternative has become so deeply embedded in our psyches and in our consciousness that we cannot imagine that there is an alternative to capitalism. And not only there's no alternative to capitalism, there seems to be no alternative to the kind of capitalism we've got. Now, that, I, that point about there being, you know, being easier to imagine the end of the world was said to me in the, first in the 1990s uh, when you know, the need to think about alternatives was not so clearly apparent. I mean, the economy was booming and, and, and things seemed to be going fine. Um, Alan Greenspan was busy sort of uh, delphically saying how the world was doing great. <laughs> So at that time, it was hard to imagine alternatives. But you would think, after we've been through what we've been through since 2007 or so, uh, that the idea that there is no alternative would, would surely be sort of thrown to one side. But what I find instead is that actually, at this particular historical moment, there's a tremendous bankruptcy of ideas as to what to do. Uh, back in the 1930s, when there was a crisis, there was at least an alternative theory lurking in the wings, which was, uh, you know, Keynes and Keynesianism and, and state involvement in the economy. And, 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 okay, there was a big battle, and there were also social movements at that time, which genuinely envisaged some, some mass alternative. I mean, there was the idea of socialism, communism, all those kinds of things were, were bubbling around. And so in the 1930s, there was a clear sense that there's, there's an alternative. And as things went on, there's got to be an alternative. And, you know, and, and ultimately, after World War II had kind of solved the economic problem, after World War II, an alternative emerged in which the state was heavily involved, in which taxation rates, for example, in this country were very high. It, I, I like to remind people, I mean, we're told by the Republicans that high taxation rates destroy growth. The taxation rate in the, on the top income brackets in this country in 1945 was 92%. Okay. It never fell below 70% until Ronald Reagan brought it down to 30. Between 1945 and Ronald Reagan, the average growth rate in the United States, well, particularly before the crisis of the 1970s, was around 4 or 5% per year. In other words, this was one of the most successful boom periods of American history when the top tax rate was always at 70-odd percent. Since Ronald Reagan, the tax rate has always hovered in the th top tax rates, hovered in the 30%. And what's been the average rate of growth since the 1970s? It's been about you know, 2%. So, so don't tell me that high tax rates are inhibit. You know, I mean, these are the kinds of mythologies that you find. But anyway, in the 1930s, there was this alternative. That alternative ran out for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to go into them in the late 1960s. And we had the, 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 the grim crisis of the 1970s. But in the 1970s, there was also an alternative. There was a critique of Keynesianism, and there was a crit critique of state involvement in the economy. Uh, and that critique was well lodged in many of the think tanks, the Institute of Economic Affairs that influenced Margaret Thatcher, and then this country, you know, the Heritage Foundation, Business Roundtable, all the rest of it. And they'd all been kind of thinking, well, we have an alternative, which is uh, an alternative which is going to solve the problem of the 1970s in a very particular way which is actually to destroy the power of labor, 
and thereby raise the profit rate and do it in a variety of ways, which included offshoring, it included technological change, it included sort of outright political assault, including coups and military occupations in Latin America and, and all the rest of it. So there was an alternative there. But when you look right now, you say, where's the alternative? In terms of social movements? In terms of, uh, of, of actually thinking? I mean, God, here at Penn, you've got the Wharton School over there. You would have thought they'd come up with an alternative by now. <laughs> but no, they're so busy sort of training themselves to go and make money that, you know, why do they want an alternative? And indeed, why would they want to make an alternative when, in fact, the leading hedge fund managers a couple of years ago got $3 billion each in personal remuneration? I mean, you know, when I tell that to students, they say, how do I, how do I get there, you know? <laughs> So, so here, here we are in this situation, and, and actually, you know, and I, I, I want to talk about some other issues, but, but I think that right now what you see is the world divided, uh, roughly divided, into two camps. There is the hysterical austerity camp, uh, which largely occupies uh, Europe and the uh, United States which says that uh, the answer to our difficulties right now is to retire the debt because we became too indebted. And it's interesting to see, you know, how capital works. I mean, one of the theses that I work out in Enigma of Capital is the idea that actually capital never solves its crisis problems, it simply moves them around. And right now is a very good moment to actually watch this game of hot potato, you know. Uh, there it is, uh, there it was in the housing markets of California and Arizona and, and Florida and all the rest of it and then it moves into the financial institutions and then it floods all around the world and there's a financial difficulty and the states mop all of that financial difficulty up and, so, and then all of a sudden there's a sovereign debt crisis of the states and the states don't know how to handle it except by doing things like uh, making the people pay. So, and, and the people at a certain point are going to say, no, we've had enough. I mean, I think the people of Iceland kind of voted not to, not to pay, and I think that eventually there's going to be a lot of movements of that kind, and we're beginning to see that in the Occupy Wall Street uh, kind of thing paying. But notice how you're shifting the burden around. And I was struck by this uh, yesterday. We had a, a demonstration at CUNY uh, over the increase in tuitions at CUNY. Now, CUNY used to be a tuition-free university. I think that's a great idea. I was actually educated in a tuition-free university system. I got the right way through to my PhD without paying anything. This is a sensible society. When you tell people that, they say, what planet did you live on? You know. <laughs> and actually, right now, the demands of the Chilean student movement in relationship to Pinochet is we want free education because the Chilean students are probably in the vanguard of a totally indebted class of people who have to pay for their education right the way through. And people are saying this is enough is enough and they've occupied the universities now for five months and they're going to do it for another five months if necessarily until they get some answer uh, to this, this compelling question. But in raising the tuition at, at CUNY, why, why is that going on and how did it happen? CUNY was tuition free up until the 1970s. Who forced tuition into CUNY? Well, the primary people engaged in that campaign were the Rockefeller brothers. The Rockefeller brothers didn't like the fact that they lived in New York and they paid taxes to support this, this, this tuition-free system. And they said, you know, rich bankers in, in, in Chicago don't have to do this and they don't have to do it elsewhere. You know, why are we paying this? We, we want... So they set up the business round table and the business round table did some incredible things. They hired a mass of independent experts to persuade everybody that actually tuition, uh, that educational standards at a, at a, at a tuition-free university were extremely low and you've got a very poor education. If you wanted a good, good education, you'd have to pay tuition. And so all of this was put out and it, it, was, it was put out in radical journals like the Reader's Digest. And then, and then the Rockefeller brothers paid to have these, these independent expert opinions from the Reader's Digest to be republished in every college newspaper across, across the CUNY system as part of this attack upon CUNY. Well, now we've got this situation where the bankers got into trouble and they got into debt 
And because they got into debt, we had a crisis. And as a result of that, New York State is a bit in debt. So it's got to de retire its debt. How does it do it? Well, one of the ways, it raises tuition on CUNY. Which does what? It increases student debt. You're privatizing the debt on the backs of students. You know, and you're creating this debt-encumbered class of students. Now, this is a good idea politically, because as somebody said about, you know, the mortgage stuff back in the 1930s, that debt-encumbered homeowners don't go on strike. Well, a debt-encumbered student has a very hard time making kind of uh, political choices which are a bit risky when the debt is hanging over them. So debt encumbrance is a real, real, real problem. So this austerity mantra which we have is an answer to the particular question. And as we see from Ireland and as we're seeing from Greece and all the rest of it, it doesn't work. Uh, what it does uh, is people get poorer and because they get poorer they spend less and the whole economy starts to go down and down further and further and further. And Keynes saw that as a problem and said, well, the only thing to do is have the government step in and kind of re get it going back in the other way. But no, no, we can't do that because the Republicans won't let you. And here is a very interesting, let me just sideline a little bit into a little piece of Marxian theory. I like to do this, you know, there's a kind of thing. Every now and again you go off and you say, oh, in volume two of Capital, Marx sets up a very little interesting little model of how a capitalist society might work. He says, imagine there are only two classes in society. There are capitalists and the workers. Where does the demand come from in that society? Well, the demand comes from the capitalist paying workers, who then spend their money on goods, and the demand comes also from capitalists buying means of production. So the total demand is means of production plus plus uh, the wage bill. What is the total supply that the capitalist creates? Well, the capitalist puts all of that to work and actually creates a surplus at the end of the day, which is called profit. So there must be more at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day. So the question is, who's going to demand that more at the end of the day? When, in fact, the demand which the capitalist has launched in is just simply the wage rate plus what they've spent on means of production. Demand at the end of the day well, it has to be bigger than that because you produce more than that. You produce the surplus, which is, underpins the profit. And Marx's answer is, well, it can't be the workers who do it, so the capitalists have to do it. Now, this is a very peculiar economy. The capitalists actually generate the surplus, and then they have to find the money to pay for it. Well, that's a very weird economy, actually, except that there's a simple way in which you can answer that question. That is, what the capitalists do is to buy now and pay later. And what they do is they actually launch further production the day after. So it's the expansion of the system the day after that mops up the expansion of the day before. And you need enough money to do that. Now, in Volume 2, Marx doesn't really explain this very well, but in Volume 3, when you introduce kind of stuff about... You, you find out that the gap between yesterday and tomorrow is filled by the credit system. So that actually buying now and paying later is like issuing IOUs. Well, that's what you do. And the IOUs then amount become larger and larger and larger as time goes on. What this leads to is a very simple relationship which is that the accumulation of capital actually matches the accumulation of debt. And in the history of capitalism, there's a crucial relationship between the two. If you retire the debt, you end capital. And I wrote a nice little piece, which sent to the Wall Street Journal, which they didn't publish, which said, well, actually, the Republican Party, if it really does insist on this debt stuff, it, it doesn't really mean it because, you know, we know what Reagan did with the debt, and we know what Bush Jr. did with the debt. If they really insist on this, they will do a better job of ending capitalism than the working class has ever done. Because if you end debt, and you end the expansion of the debt economy, you end the possibility for the accumulation of capital. That is, capitalism is over. Okay? There's one answer to your question. No question mark about that. 
But this then, of course, immediately poses some problems about, well, how is the debt managed? And debt management then becomes crucial to the dynamics of a capitalist system. And what we've seen is debt management going crazy, of course, over the last few years. Now, one of the things that became very important to me, again, in writing Enigma of Capital, is to look back and say, you know, this question of relationship between debt and accumulation, how, how, how has it actually worked historically, and where did it come from? And I found a very, very interesting mass of literature back in, on the 16th, 17th century, which the economic historians have created, which is about what they call the fiscal military state. And it's about the way in which debt, state debt in particular, and militarization kind of went together. Uh, and that's how the wars were fought and, and all the rest of it, and, and what a crucial role this played in the dynamics and the origins of capitalism, one that has been largely left uh, un, unexamined. And out of this came this idea that, well, actually, capitalism requires something that I called a state finance nexus, which is a sort of, some sort of configuration of state and capitalist power which working together can actually orchestrate what needs to be orchestrated in terms of this relationship between debt accumulation and accumulation of wealth. It has some way to do that. And if you look historically, you find that you, this, this, this begins to become apparent, particularly in British history, the formation of this debt finance nexus. Now, the contemporary version of this struck me very forcibly uh, in the wake of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. Because who appeared on television after the bankruptcy? We didn't see the president. Who did we see? We saw Ben Bernanke, who's the top of the, fin of the, of the banking system. And we saw Paulson. That's the state finance nexus. They were it. And at that point, they were the ones who came out with bits of paper and said, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And Bush kind of said, oh, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, fine, yeah, all right, fine, yeah, yeah, ooh, ooh. We all were like that. They came out, they decided. That was the state finance nexus at work. And it was a very, very brilliant thing because the state finance nexus, by and large, doesn't want to be seen. It always remains hidden. There's a great book about the Federal Reserve that called, it's called The Secrets of the Temple. It's almost like a feudal institution, sort of, there. You know. It's a bit like the Vatican. That you, you can't tell what's going on, and you, know, you expect the Federal Reserve to pump black s smoke out of its <laughs> one point or other, or white smoke on another day. You know. So uh, you, you kind of... It, it's, 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 a very, it, it's very powerful. Now, actually, the, the, this history is, is, is wonderfully recounted in a number of ways. And, and quite by chance, I read, a, I read a historical novel by Hilary Mantel called To Rule Fall, which is about a man called Thomas Cromwell. And actually, the subtext of that book is about the formation of the state finance nexus. It's about the way in which the monarchy had to negotiate with the merchants and the merchants connected to the monarchy. And you know, Cromwell was the one guy who kind of, after working with Cardinal Wolsey, figured out you follow the money and then you know where everything is. You know, that's what it's all about. And so he was the one who was, was, was crucial in creating, if you like, the origins of this, of this, of this finance, uh, state finance nexus. Now, how does this state finance nexus work, and what is the balance of power within that state finance nexus? And this, is a, I think, seems to me a kind of crucial question, because what we see, we don't, we, we don't really see this very easily. You have to look for indicators of it. But let me give you what I think was perhaps the crucial moment when we saw a switch of power relations. And that switch of power relations was, was most clearly revealed to me uh, when Bill Clinton was elected to the presidency. And there is this story, which I'm assured was not apocryphal, where he was sitting with his, his economic advisors, but even before he was sworn in, and being Bill Clinton, he was always thinking about, well, how do I get re-elected and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> And he was asking his economic advisors, you know, what to do in terms of economic policy and how to do it. And the, the advisors were, were, were telling him things. And he was getting irritable and more and more irritable. And at the end, he burst out and he kind of said, you mean to say my re-election chances and all of my economic policy has to be geared to the ideas of a bunch of fucking bond traders? 
And the answer was yes. <laughs> and look what Clinton did. He came in promising us the universal health care. What did he give us? He gave us the WTO, he gave us NAFTA, he gave us the reform of welfare as we know it. Uh, he actually is partly to blame for this whole kind of subprime fiasco because uh, that's you know, in the 1990s, that's when you started to bottom feed in the, in, in the housing markets. But that remark suggests that actually at that point political power was no longer in a position to dominate over financial power. And I think that's very critical to understand. Now, I tracked back a little bit and I found, I found a very interesting point where that general conclusion had been arrived at by the great guru economists. That in the wake of the stock market crash of 1987, Black Monday, you know, and I don't know, crop, crash, just tremendous crash in the stock market, which was also connected to this sort of grumbling crisis of the savings and loan, uh, in which more than 1,300 banking institutions went under in the United States. And uh, at that point, uh, William Isaacs actually threatened the banking sector with nationalization if they didn't clean up their act. So that period, 1987, there was, a, and after that happened, people asked questions. They had this big meeting of all of the, you know, all of the big guys, you know, Summers and Volcker and all those other people sitting around kind of saying, how do we understand what happened in 1987? And of course, being economists, they couldn't agree. But one thing that did come out as fairly consensual, that the United States was no longer in a position to decide unilaterally. That a crisis of that sort could not be managed simply by the US. It would require international agreement, international action. And I think that that was a very, very before that, if things happened, the United States unilaterally would do this or unilaterally do that or strong arm people into doing something. It was the hegemon, as we call it. It dominated the world system. It was able to do what it wanted to. But in 1987, it suddenly found it couldn't do it. And thereafter, what we've seen is a growth, as it were, of this whole kind of question of who, where's the political power located that can manage this whole system? And we saw in the wake of Lehman Brothers that the G7 and, was not, and the G8 were not enough, and we went to the G20. Notice, what you're doing is you're going, you're looking. You get to a point right now when you look at it and you say, well, actually, the only way in which political power can now actually exercise power over the bond markets is by collective action. That is, there has to be almost a global government, which is going to actually consensually decide. It doesn't have to be a kind of, you know, hierarchically organized, monocentric, but it has to be total agreement between them as to what to do and how, how to do it. What we saw in the wake of the Lehman Brothers was an immediate period of brief agreement between everybody. We've got to stabilize this system. After the system gets stabilized, roughly, then they all break apart and go their own way. And I thought it was very interesting. Obama went to the meeting in Seoul of the G20 and basically had a whole bunch of propositions and nobody listened to him. Merkel kind of said, no, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing that. So you've got the austerity thing, and the austerity is, is stuck in a certain kind of mode, and it's a political decision and a political choice. And I want to go back to, I think, to this simple, uh, simple uh, very simple and overly simplistic idea, obviously, which is the political cho choice is being driven by class power. The political choice in this country is driven by class power, clearly, and this is what the Occupy Wall Street people are saying, basically, you know, We've got, to, we've, we've got to confront that power. And it's very interesting. You know, I can't remember so many cops surrounding the Tea Party rallies. <laughs> and they would turn up with guns, and maybe the cops kind of thought, oh, well, we've got to keep out of there, you know. But, you know, 100 students at CUNY, and we have something like 300 cops outside glaring at you, pushing you around. I mean, this is kind of, seriously, seriously, this is, seems to be a major threat to political power, simply to talk about social inequality and the inequalities of political power which, which go with it. The fact that the party of Wall Street, as I call it, owns both political parties, it owns Congress, but then I suppose it's done it ever since Mark Twain remarked that the Congress is the best that money can buy. 
And so you, you, you've, you've, you've got this, this and, and of course they dominate the media and, they, they, and, 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 and indirectly they dominate the judiciary and, and everything else. So the, 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 we live in a, in a class dominated society where the one thing you can't talk about is class domination. Because I, I don't know, there's something nasty about that, you know, you, you might be socialist or something awful like that. So, so here we have this, and, 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 and this strategy is, of course, has been long-standing. And it's a way of using the debt for political purposes. Now, there's a sort of saying, you never let a good crisis go to waste. And in this instance, what we've seen is a couple of crises which have not been gone to waste. But I'd like to suggest to you there's a certain continuity here. When Ronald Reagan came to power, what did he do? He reduced the top tax rate from 70 to 30 percent, as I've already remarked. He had an arms race with the Soviet Union, huge arms race, which was deficit financed. And towards the end of the Reagan administration, David Stockman, his budget director, said, well, our plan was to run up the debt in such a way that in order to retire the debt, we could get rid of all of the social programs we didn't like and cut all of the environmental regulations which, which industry doesn't like. And that, of course, was what they set about doing. So the debt was an excuse to do that. It was an excuse to lead a class assault upon social <coughs> welfare structures and a class assault upon environmental regulation. <coughs> what did George Bush Jr. do? Fought two unfunded wars, cut the tax rate on the top. Big deal with Big Pharma to sort of give them loads and loads of money. None of it was funded. The debt was run up like crazy. All the time that he was, in, he was in power, Dick Cheney always said, Ronald Reagan taught us deficits don't matter. That's the Republicans for you. Deficits don't matter. What he really meant was, well, when we get the debt up there far enough, we'll be able to go after all the social programs and all the environmental regulations we don't like. And what the hell is happening right now? That is exactly what they're doing. It is a class assault upon the well-being of the most vulnerable people in the population, and it is a class assault upon anything to do with environmental, you know, sustainability. Or... So this is a political choice. And it is a political choice in Britain, and it's a political choice throughout much of Europe. That what you're doing is, everybody's pointing out, you know, what you're doing is actually suckering the rich and screwing the poor. But that's been going on for some time. Actually, that's what the IMF did to Mexico in, in, in 1982. That's what a structural adjustment program is classically like. And I'm very proud of the fact that a book that I published in 2003 looked at the aggregate data of the United States and said, look, in any other case, the United States was ripe for structural adjustment. The trouble is, of course, the United States is the IMF, and so it's not going to structurally adjust itself. But now, in effect, we are being structurally adjusted. And actually, the powers that be are busy pushing that structural adjustment on us. Now, that's one part of the world. The other part of the world is doing exactly the opposite. It's not going into the... So it hasn't got the monetarist theory, and it hasn't got all of the kind of, you know, all of that, all of that you know, Milton Friedman stuff. The other part of the world, based in China, is doing exactly the opposite. They're, in effect, doing a Keynesian program. Now, China for whatever reasons, didn't sort of decide it was a good idea. But again, political forces were very, very significant. In China, they are deadly scared of major unrest on the part of a population which has a long history of being pretty restive at various times. And in 2009, at the beginning of 2000, just around the beginning of 2009, just after Lehman Brothers had gone under, the Chinese, in about three months, lost 30 million jobs because the export industries crashed. Nine months later, the IMF did a study which showed that the net job loss in China was 3 million, i.e. the Chinese had managed to recuperate 27 million jobs in about six months. How the hell did they do that? Well, one of the things they did was to launch an enormous physical infrastructural development program. It was equivalent to what the United States did with the interstate highway systems in the 1950s and 1960s. 
They built whole new cities. They built high-speed train networks. They, you know, I mean, the, the, their, their stimulus package, just simply by the central government, was about the equivalent to that which the United States had set up. But it also turned to the banks and said to the banks, lend. Now, there's a wonderful moment, if you've seen the, uh, the movie Too Big to Fail and, or read the book by Sorkin about Too Big to Fail, right at the end after they've struck this deal and they've made the banks accept all this money, and, and uh, Bernanke says, well, I hope that they'll lend it out. <laughs> and, and Paulson says, oh, of course they'll lend it out. Well, of course they might lend it out. And of course they didn't. But if you're a Chinese banker and you don't do what the central government tells you to do, <laughs> oh boy, you're in trouble. So the, the banks lent out furiously to all these development projects. The, the result was been a, a boom in property prices in China, property development in China, which matches the boom that's been going, went on in the 1990s uh, into 2000 in this country. It's a huge, huge boom. And as a result of that, the Chinese, of course, have, 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 have actually launched demand into the rest of the world economy at a huge rate. The Chinese have consumed half of the world's steel output in the last five years. Half of the world's cement supplies. Now where does steel come from? Well, where does the iron ore come from? Where, do, where does the copper come from? It comes from places like Chile, Australia. You go to Chile and Australia and people say to you, what, what, what crisis? Argentina, Brazil, doing fine. Expanding by 5-7% because China's expanding at 10%. India's catching up with China now. So, so half of the world is on this expansionary game. And the other half is on this austerity game. And, of course, it's very, very interesting to see, you know, how in the United States people say government can't actually do anything to expand the economy. And you say, what the hell are they doing in China? You know? Oh, and, and, by the way, look at, hey, take a look at Singapore and a few other places as well. You know, the government's heavily, heavily involved. And, in fact, the only successful economies over the last 10, 20 years have been those which have been centrally directed. And yet we've got this mantra, this mantra, you know, which is, which is, I don't know, living on some other planet. So you have these two, two things, but the Chinese model is, is not stable either for exactly the same reasons that the Keynesian thing ran out. But China's gone through the Keynesian thing of the 1950s and 1960s in this country, almost compressed in, in about three years. And one of the things I started to get nervous about was the great bugaboo of the, of the Keynesian thing, which is strong inflation. Inflation in China has been edging upwards and, and actually zooming upwards. Uh, and, 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 of course, inflation in many of the other countries around it, in Argentina, Brazil, and so on, has become a real problem. So here you have deflation and there you have inflation. One half of the world is being monetarist and the other half is being Keynesian. Well, we've tried both of those solutions sequentially in time, and they didn't work. Now we're trying them geographically, half and half of the world doing this and the other half doing that. Neither of which is going to work. So where's the third solution? And in the China case, they started to cut back, and it's very interesting, just today I read, you know, they started to cut back a few weeks ago, and suddenly property prices started to crash in China. They went down by 20% in about three months in some of the key cities in, the, in, in China. And everybody started to panic. And now what has the government done? It's actually gone back and said, okay, banks, lend, lend, lend. Get back into the game. So there's a frantic attempt in China to sort of stabilize things uh, by, you know, by playing the, 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 these games. In the same way that we're seeing in this, in, in this part of the world, and in Europe in particular, we're seeing this, this, this incredible game uh, being played of uh, you know, trying to deal with uh, the, debt, the sovereign debt problem in a very, in very peculiar kinds of ways. So m the point of this is, is to say that actually I don't see at this particular point any major alternative in the horizon in terms of what capital can do. On the basis, on the basis of what has been going on the last 30 years, I can make some rough predictions as to where things might go. Um, and this is a bit like weather forecasting, where, where I was assured by one of my colleagues who's expert at this, that actually if you say the weather tomorrow is going to be roughly the same as it is today, you'll be right 60% of the time. 
and there's an immense amount of effort put in to try to get the predictability up to 80% of the time, you know, but 60% of the time, eh, it'll be the same as tomorrow. And, and, and a bit on that basis, what can we really expect? Now, I've already mentioned this, what this seems to be this key switch in the state finance nexus where, put crudely, bond markets dominate sovereign political power. And they're dominating, as we see in Europe, very, very strongly. Uh, we're not seeing it here in the United States, but in effect, that is, that is what's happening here in the United States as well. So, if that's the case, then the big question is, what's happening in those markets? And, and how can we understand what they're doing and in what direction they are moving? What we're seeing, of course, is it's not only are you actually dominating political power in the way that Bill Clinton recorded it, but what we now see in Europe is if effectively the overthrow of democratically elected governments and the appointment of technicians who are doing the will of the bond markets. Two governments now. Pretty soon, if you don't willingly actually do what the bond markets want, you'll be in that lot too. So what does this mean for democracy? Now, there's a very interesting problem that lies behind this, which is really what I want to really emphasize. Capitalism has always been about expansion, for the reasons I've already mentioned. It's always been about growth. Uh, have you ever heard anybody who's pro-capitalist say they're anti-growth? In effect, a crisis is defined as zero growth, right? I mean, since when is zero growth a crisis? I mean, actually, it turns out zero growth is one of the best things that can happen to the environment, but leave that aside. Historically, the volume of goods and services has grown probably around the rate of 2.25% per year, but it's a compound rate of growth. Marx has a wonderful kind of little argument where he kind of says, well, actually, this guy in 1780 calculated that if he had invested a sovereign on the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, there would now be enough sovereigns to actually fill up half of the universe. No, solar system, sorry. That's, a bit... That's what compound growth does. 3% compound growth is considered a reasonable kind of way for capitalism to work. 4 or 5% is really good. 10% people start to, if it's 10% in aggregate, people start to worry about it's overheating and all that kind of stuff. Less than 3%, things are sluggish. Zero, you're in a crisis. I mean, that's the general story you'll get from the financial press. You'll find everybody saying, we've got to get back to 3% growth. Oh, my God, next year there's a forecast in the United States. It's going to be 1.2%. What are we going to do? You know, this kind of stuff. So capital is always about growth, and it's about compound growth. 3% compound growth back in 1780, no problem. 3% compound growth right now, real problem, real problem. Because when you think of the global capitalist economy and where it is, the frontier has closed. I mean, the Soviet Union collapsed. That's now opened up. China has entered the system. There's no, there's no geographical frontier. I mean, okay, parts of Africa haven't yet been fully absorbed, and there are parts of Central Asia, and, but relatively but basically speaking, in the same way there was a big impact when the frontier closed in this country back in the sort of 1890s or whenever, so the frontier, the geographical frontier has closed. There's no way in which you can expand the system. Now, that doesn't mean there's no geographical outlets because you can go, as was mentioned earlier, do some creative destruction. You can deindustrialize all of the United States, which has happened. You can deindustrialize much of Britain and then you can, you know, turn them all into sort of condominiums and shopping malls and all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, you can readjust the whole geography internally by intensification and transformation. But one of the things you will notice, and this comes back also to this notion of weather forecasting about tomorrow is going to look like today. One of the things you will notice since the 1970s onwards is that as finance has become more liberated, and can go and do its thing. <clears throat> it's become more volatile. 
it started actually to develop completely new market structures. Many of them are actually rather old, but were very minor, but they became major very quickly, like hedge funds and, and, and the like. And what that suggests is that actually the credit system is in itself generating new market possibilities, new possibilities for the accumulation of wealth. And that is precisely what we've been seeing, of course, in, in, in what's happened in financial markets since the 1990s in particular. And as the credit markets become capable of generating more and more wealth almost internally, People can suck more and more wealth out of it. And much of the concentration of wealth that's occurred uh, in the world has occurred through, of course, sucking wealth out of financial markets. I mean, the hedge funds I mentioned, three billion each. I mean, I thought it was pretty outrageous in 2003 when the leading hedge fund people got 250 million each, but now they get three billion. You know, one of them who got three billion two years ago is having a hard time this year, poor fellow. So I think that, that what we have here is and it's a category that I really like in Marx. It's called fictitious capital. That actually, fictitious capital has always played a very important role in the dynamics of accumulation for the reasons that I've mentioned about you know, getting from yesterday's de you know, supply to you know, today's demand kind of thing. But fictitious capital has become much more, more significant in the system. And as fictitious capital has become much more s significant, so what we've seen is a kind of almost a closure of, of what, how that fictitious capital works. Now, when you we use the word fictitious capital, people kind of say, well, it's a very abstract contact, contact, concept. Give me an idea of what you mean. What I mean is this. There's a very interesting positionality of financial institutions. Who lends the money to the developers who build tract housing around San Diego? The financial institutions do. Okay, so the tract housing is built, you know, the laborers get paid, you know, everything goes on, and then at the end of the day, the houses are there. Who do they sell them to? Well, they sell them to, to some people who need a mortgage to buy them. Who provides the mortgage? Well, actually, the same financial institution that, that actually funded the developers also provides the mortgage and in fact they had package deals uh, when the, the developers started to develop uh, you could go, the financial institution would offer you a deal you know where you can get in on it even before it's built you know things like that so you could actually now you see what's happening here is that actually the financial institution regulates the supply and the demand All right? and of course because it's regulating the supply and demand, it is also in a position to manipulate prices. And, 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 and as it manipulates prices, and so, so pretty soon, you know, you get the asset bubble in the housing market going on and on and on. And if at the end of the day, the, you know, the financial institution can't find anybody to buy it because they haven't got enough good credit rating, you say, well, instead of 20% down, why don't we say 10% down? And then after a bit, well, instead of 10% down, why not 5% down? After a bit, oh, well, well you know, just, uh, we get our money out of fees anyway. We don't care about the mortgage. We just package it off and sell it to some unsuspecting municipality in Norway saying it's as safe as houses. And the fact that later on they won't be able to pay their police service is too bad. So this is, a, this is, this is the way fictitious capital works. And what we've seen are more and more signs of fictitious capital operating in this way and immense wealth being extracted in this way by certain classes in a society. And along with that goes a tremendous concentration of wealth. And what we've seen, as everybody obviously knows, over the last 30 years is tremendous concentrations of, 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 of wealth and, and, and income, and, and that wealth and income then has tremendous implications for the wielding of political power. So you end up with a, with, a, with a following prediction, that if this system continues and we do not make any radical changes in it, and I see no sign of any radical changes coming uh, from, from pretty much any quarter, if we make no radical changes in it, we're simply going to perpetuate in which one half of the world is going to be actually drawing immense wealth on the basis of fictitious operations, 
while the rest of us will be looking for enough to eat. And we know already the amount of poverty and the amount of hunger amongst children in this country has been increasing, and we will see that in many other parts of the world. So here's, here's if you like, that one scenario. And, and where, but then you ask the question, who is, who, is really, who is really kind of confronting the dynamics of that scenario? And, and is, is able to tell us exactly why it's happening in the way it's happening. This is, takes a lot of hard work and a lot of hard thinking. And frankly, we just don't have institutes of thinking that actually are prepared to grapple with these, these sorts of questions in the, in, in the degree they need to be grappled with. I mean, I, I try and do my little bit, but, you know, I'm pretty isolated. You know, and, and certainly I, I would never get interviewed on any of the mainstream media. And, and I pretty much get isolated, you know. Not, not true in Britain, by the way. I get on the BBC, but, you know. Uh, the BBC still has a residual of something or other that doesn't exist in this country. So, so you look at that, and, and, and you kind of look at a, at a rather, rather dismal situation. The other possibility would be the China model, which will take, will, will, will take root. And it's interesting, there are a number of think tanks in this country, and I've been reading the, the, the commentaries, on many of which are beginning to say, you know, this, this big stuff that's going on is so big that uh, obviously democracy can't work. That we need these macro decisions to be made by a, an elite group of, of people. And in fact, we need to set up a form of governance in this country which rather parallels that of China. I mean, people are serious, I don't say it that way, but in, in effect, that's what they're saying. Uh, because all this democracy in Washington is screwing things up. I mean, look at it, it's just a mess. And, and, and so what we'll do is we'll have democracy will be local. <coughs> you can, you know, be democratic about what trying to trees get planted in your, pl in your park or something like that, but, but you know, the, macro, the big macro questions are going to be handled by, uh, by an elite group. So the China model starts to become rather attractive as actually a form of governance that can actually work. But, as I've suggested, the 3% growth, compound growth, which is not quite being achieved in the global economy right now through this balance of the China growing at 10% and India at 9% and, you know, and the United States at 1% and Europe at 0%. That, that scenario... Is, 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 is not possible to go forward over the next 50 years. That is, something radically different has to happen. And that radically different can either be the scenario I just said, which would have capital actually move into a completely fictitious world, in which uh, it would almost be a kind of virtual capitalism, where people would be living on vast amounts of wealth and power, uh, probably a concentration of wealth and power that would have 50 families control about 80% or 90% of global wealth, which is not impossible given the, the current dynamics. I mean, the number of billionaires who've erupted in India in the last, uh, you know, there were 26 billionaires in India five years ago, there are now 69. Uh, the billionaires in China are now catching up with those in the United States. So, you know, these concentrations of wealth are, are, are already there and, 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 and they're not going away. They have not been hurt by the crisis. In fact, they've increased during the crisis. So you either look at an increasingly polarized society in which the wealthy will live in their ghettos and the rest of us will be sort of scrabbling for scraps uh, around everywhere else. It's either that or else there's going to be some sort of radical eruption against all of this. And then the question arises, well, where do you start and what do you have to do in order to devise an anti-capitalist economy? What would an anti-capitalist economy look like? Now, to me, that is in itself an extremely interesting question because what it has to do is, is to actually talk about what is the nature of capital and what, it is it, what is it that we have to be anti and there are two arguments, again, that come out of Marx, Volume 2. The first is that capital, money is not capital. Commodities are not capital. Even the buying and selling of labor power is not capital. What is capital is a class relation between 
capital and labor in the act of production that allows capital to extract a surplus from the work of the laborer. What that leads to is to say, well, the alternative to capitalism has to be worker self-management. And Marx again and again actually says the associated laborers in charge of their own production processes, making their own decisions, should be the base of any alternative system. Now, this is odd, you know, because Glenn Beck and Harold Beers always goes on about how, you know, Marxists are always about state domination, about this and that and that and that's not true. Marx was about the associated laborers controlling their own, their own production processes. But, the end of volume two, you have a problem. How do you actually control and, and coordinate the activities of these many, many different groups controlling their own production? How do you make sure that if you want to make a car that the steel is there, and enough steel is there, that enough rubber is there? How do, you, how do those proportionalities work out? The general idea in, in, in theoretically in, under capitalism is the market does it for you. And that uh, the alternative, which is sort of centralized state planning, is a disaster. Uh, and right now the left doesn't want to talk about any kind of centralized state planning because, you know, the left is basically about local action and local, you know, it's all in favor of the associated laborers controlling their own thing, but not thinking about the question of coordination. So how does coordination work? Well, actually, the corporations know how to do it, because actually the corporations don't work through the market very much. They actually have a control and command system back through their supply chain. They send an order down their supply chain and say, we want so much steel, or oh, we want so much you know, of this, or so much of that. They don't actually go out and haggle in the market and say, okay, now I've got the steel, now I can do it. No, no, they, they orchestrate it. And it's all orchestrated on a just-in-time system in which they say, we want so much steel on such and such a day, and we want so much more steel on the day after that, and then we want this amount of, uh, you know. So actually, corporations engage in centralized planning and in a very sophisticated way. And it's not hard at all to imagine that capacity for centralized planning, it, but it currently exists in corporations, Walmart, for example, does it beautifully. It's not hard to imagine taking that over and turning it to a social purpose instead of turning it into mere profiteering. And when I say that to people, say, well, you like Walmart? And my answer is, well, they've come up with some techniques that we can use. And we shouldn't run away from talking about those techniques just because Walmart has it. We should, we should really study those things and figure out how it works. Because the one centrally planned economy which really worked extremely well was World War II in the United States. Which was when Roosevelt called all the corporate heads to Washington and said to them, you know how to plan all this stuff, get it done. We want the ships, we want the tanks, we want the aircraft and we want it done and we want it done fast. And boy did they do it well and boy did they do it fast. And that was one of the things that terrified corporate capital, that they were actually part of a centrally planned economy. And they were the agents of a centrally planned economy, which was actually something that Marx envisioned. He talked about joint stock companies and he said, actually, these are associated capitals. The individual capitalist is gone. Associated capitals knows how to do these things. That is the transitional organization that can take us into another world. And I think that that is, if you like, one of the ideas that I'd like to throw out. That there is an alternative, and it already exists. We just have to be able to go in and understand how it's working right now and how it can be converted to something completely different. That is what we need to do. But before we do that, we've also got to demystify all of this nonsense, which we're taught you know, by the neoliberal economists and, and, you know, and, and, and even the Keynesians, that somehow or other uh, deepening what we're currently doing is going to be the answer to the difficulties we're in. Compound growth forever is impossible. An alternative has to arise in which there's a zero growth economy. Economic inequality has to be eradicated. Environmental degradation has to be stopped. And there's only one way to do it, and that's to end capitalism. Thanks very much.
Given the Supreme Court decision granting uh, corporate personhood, um, what are the chances of why is what are the chances that it's going to make it much more difficult to end capitalism? And is Russ Feingold, in his efforts to undo that, uh, a worthwhile first step? All right. Well, uh, Professor Harvey, just thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm, my name is Nick. I'm an undergraduate from out at Swarthmore College. And on Monday, um, Robert Putnam um, came to Swarthmore College, and I think one of the things he was saying was that in America today, the distribution of social capital, which is really the, one of the focuses of his work, has come to mirror more and more the distribution of financial capital. Um, so the distribution of goods and social organizations, you know, such as education or you know involvement in church, um, a lot of these forms of social organization have come to be increasingly centered you know, in or class divided, rather. And I'd just like to ask if you think that's the case and what you think the implications of that are for, you know, the continuation or end of capitalism. Okay, on, hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, on my way over here tonight, I was hearing the news about uh, President Obama campaigning for the extension of the payroll tax uh, deduction, the reduction, I think it's 3%, whatever. And I'm wondering if this is not a part of a long-term strategy to uh, create, uh, basically to destroy Social Security, as that is what it funds. Hmm. Uh, the um, personhood of co corporations, um, I think one of the more serious things that happened historically, and I think uh, I, I heard somewhere the other day that uh, actually it never uh, came, ab came about, it really came about by accident and subterfuge that uh, people started to treat corporations as individuals. Uh, and uh, I think that actually rolling that back is a very crucial part of uh, uh, the immediate reform, immediate reform requirements. So I'm, I'm very much in favour of, uh, of, of withdrawing that. I mean, uh, I, I do, I do have this kind of problem that uh, if you treat them as persons and you can't put them in jail, then what does, what does that do? Um, social capital and financial capital. Yes, I think they go very much together, and I think that the, this is the financialization of pretty much all aspects of daily life is becoming a very, very serious uh, uh, issue uh, for, for many, many people. And, and that, that relationship, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a dialectic, if you will, because uh, on the one hand, you need financial capital in order to get the social capital, and then the social capital is the means to get the finance. And so the two go, go together, and you see a lot of that going on inside of the educational system. I've lost count of the number of times when I ask sort of kids, for example, and sometimes in, you know, casually, or, well, what do you envisage doing when you graduate? And they say, well, I'm going to go and make money. And you say, well, is that the only ambition you have? Well, yeah. What else is there? You kind of go, well, actually, there's a lot else, but I, I think, but, you know. But, but, it, but this is what I mean by, you, you know, we're all neoliberals now without knowing it. And we're all kind of Thatcherites without knowing it. And, and it's so deeply ingrained now in our ways of thinking that we, you know, I mean, even I wake up in the morning and go and check my financial capital, and particularly my pension fund, and say, oh, my God, another day it's gone down another 5%. But, but so, it, so, so we, we, get, we, get, we, we get that in, in, in involvement. Um, and, and uh, I don't, I'm not so sure about this, this payroll tax thing. I think, I think in the, in the immediate, I mean, I would worry about Social Security for other reasons, but, uh, for, for obvious reasons, but um, I think the, uh, this is the only way that Obama, who would like to do some modest Keynesian kind of stimulus, can get it through <laughs> by putting, putting the Republicans in such a, a box that they can't really say no. And, and to the degree that financial stimulus is going to be absolutely crucial to his re-election chances, then I see it more as a sort of short-run 
uh, kind of a, an attempt to, to, to get a bit of a mild stimulus through, through the pay, this payroll tax extension. I don't, I don't attach anything more sinister to it than that. Um, may, but it could, of course, impinge upon uh, the future of Social Security, but I, I think that's another kind of question that can be res resisted in its own right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor Harvey. I just have a question. Um, I'd like to hear some of your comments on what's taking place in Latin America, particularly a lot of the social strides in Venezuela, Bolivia. I just read that um, Daniel Ortega, the new president of Nicaragua, is not going to be recognized by Washington. Um, so kind of something along the lines, do you think Washington is threatened by uh, what's going on in Latin America? Do you think that the uh, Bolivarian Alliance for, for the Americas um, can be a significant uh, way to keep uh, the money circulating within Latin America. Do you think there's a hope there for kind of another alternative possibly in the near future? Thanks. Hi, Professor Harvey. Please forgive my bouncing. Um, I have a three-month-old on my shoulder. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know uh, what your message would be tonight to the folks who are going to be coming out of jail at the Roundhouse and for the others who've been either occupying at City Hall with them or who've been supporting them. Yeah. Oh, uh, you suggest that zero growth is the model, but with a growing population, where will the jobs come if you have zero growth? Okay, the message to uh, the jailed folk is the struggle continues. It has to. You can't stop. I mean, I, I, I think it's terribly important at this moment that, that we be persistent. We've had all of these movements over the last few years that have erupted and then gone down. And, and uh, in effect, uh, the powers that be are used to the idea that there's going to be a massive march uh, one day and then it's all going to disappear and nobody's going to notice. Uh, you know. it, and that's why I think it was so important to occupy the space and keep it occupied. And I think we have to keep on occupying spaces as much as we possibly can, recognizing, of course, that uh, this is, uh, you know, running into all of the problems you know full well. But, but uh, it, it's very important that we not get diverted and divided. That's the other issue that I would, I would say. Let's keep, solid, let's keep solidarity. Let's keep, you know, uh, let's keep at it and, and keep, the, keep the message simple because there's a very simple problem here, which is just simply the concentration of wealth and power and the way in which it is exercising political domination. That's it. Um, uh, Latin America is a very, because it's a very diverse uh, uh, place. I mean, I, I get nervous about lumping everything together in Latin America. Uh, you know, I think the, what happened in Venezuela and to some degree, uh, Nicaragua, um, I, I have to say I'm a, I'm a little bit skeptical about some of the, pros, some of the things going on in those, in, in those two countries. Uh, on the other hand, what happened in Bolivia was really absolutely stunning uh, from 2000, 2005. I think now they've got the classic kind of problem of what happens when you get state power. So, and I think Morales is in a difficult situation of having to compromise if you like, with uh, the outside forces and to some degree with his own internal bourgeoisie and he also needs to extract the resources to get the money to develop and at the same time the indigenous populations and so there's a very difficult situation emerging in Bolivia but I have great admiration for what the Bolivians have, have done and similarly I have great admiration for what's going on in Chile. I mean it's really stunning uh, what, 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 the, what the students are doing and they're, they're extremely articulate, very well organized and I went to a high school, and the, some of the high schools are occupied, and it's incredible just listening to 15-year-olds talking about, you know, political processes and so on. And, and by the way, one, something that's very interesting about the Chilean movement is that uh, in 2006, there was a, a, an eruption in the high schools. This is the same cohort that did the eruption in the high schools in 2006 that's now in the universities. They know what they're doing. And, 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 but they've been at it for five, ten years, you know. And I think we have to also think of, imagine ourselves being at this for five, ten years. Because this is not going to be solved very easily. Political power is incredibly, incredibly nervous. I mean, you can see by the, the, the amount, the way in which they're, 
orchestrating police presences and all this kind of stuff. It's just kind of just just just, just amazing. So it's going to be a long uh, a, a long a long haul. Um, sorry, what was the last question? It was uh, zero oh zero growth. Yeah, you know. I've been around a long time and I've heard that actually the problem to, of global poverty can only be solved by redistributing out of growth. That's what I've heard since 1950. I'm old enough to remember what they said in 1950. It never happened. It's got worse. Now if there was going to be real redistribution out of growth, I would say, yeah, let's have a bit more growth then. And I think I'm not against growth everywhere or of every sort, you know, obviously. You've got to be nuanced about it and there are some parts of the world where growth I think is probably necessary. Yeah, but, but you know, some of the growth you see around in the United States, do we really need that? You know, I, I mean... And a lot of that growth is, is, around, is around crazy consumerist kind of nonsense and, and, and can easily be dispensed with. But, and then you kind of say, well, you know, but if, if, if people are not going to consume, then where are the jobs going to come from? Well, you know, this is like, you know, my, I used to have these big fights with my mother. My mother says, you can't get rid of capitalists because they give us jobs. And you say, excuse me, there are all sorts of other ways you can get jobs. I mean, we can go out collectively and do stuff. I mean, there's loads of stuff that needs to be done. I mean, there are schools falling apart. There are all kinds of things. You know, loads and loads of, loads of work needs to be done. All we need to do is to find adequate incomes and adequate, you know, living wages and things like that for, for all of those jobs. And if we took uh, the billions that are, are earned in one year and distribute them around and, 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 and sort of had living wages for, for you know, thousands of people, then, then you know, you'd have the jobs and, and, and much more useful things were being done. Uh, I mean, you know, so, so I, I, think, uh, I think it's perfectly compatible to have a zero growth and considerable redistribution of resources that allows everybody to have a decent standard of living. I mean, right now you have half of the world living and, and getting obese because it can't, you know, it keeps on consuming far too much. And the other half is trying to live on less than $2 a day. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I think that it, 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 you know, it takes a political movement to, to, to redistribute, but a, a lot of redistribution has to be has to be uh, pushed into the political agenda. Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I have a question in thinking about an alternative future and uh, also in relation to the Occupy movement. Um, in my personal opinion, the Occupy movement is not a singular movement. It's only a beginning to... Um, more uh, to to an alternative future. So uh, at at the towards the end of your talk, you talk about how we can actually learn from institutions like Walmart and uh, just in time management. And uh, I just wonder if you have uh, any specific comments uh, about how we can actually integrate these uh, technologies into future social movements. Um, my question is, do you think the recent fluctuations of the stock market are some kind of method of extraction? And uh, if so, how, how can that be stopped? I'd like your thoughts on the following two statements. One, perhaps technology has come so far that we don't need everyone working. If you have one person feeding 100 people, is there going to be a permanent unemployed because we're just so efficient? The second thing is overpopulation is surely a fundamental driver of many problems. And sooner or later we're going to hit into an environmental wall. How do we address the uh, problem of world overpopulation? Let's take one more. Thank you. <laughs> um, you spent a long time making a really great case for the end of capitalism, but since there isn't a David Harvey think tank yet, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on some of the solutions and maybe give us an agenda. Well, you have to get me back next year to do that. <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, I'll match that with the, actually the first question. I think, um, you know, Social movements are, are the bubbling up all over the place with different ideas. Um, one of the arguments I have with uh, 
many of my students and also with uh, some of the people in the social movements, is that there seems to they often a, a bit of a victim of what I call a fetishism of organizational form. That there's only one organizational form that's going to work. And, and you know, well, the favorite one is horizontality. Everything has to be horizontal. And I kind of say, well, you know, I, you know and I, I love these assembly things and horizontality and all of that. I think it's great. On the other hand, you know, if, you, if, if, if I'm, and I say, imagine you're, you're on, a, on a jet and you're flying across the Atlantic and all of a sudden the pilot comes on and says, well, we've got a bit of a hold up here. The, the, the air traffic controllers in New York City have gone into assembly mode and are, are now deciding whether they prefer United Airlines to Continental in terms of their labor practices. Uh, you know, there, there, are, there are many aspects of the uh, contemporary world which are what I call tightly coupled systems which need instantaneous decision making. I wouldn't want my anarchist friends in charge of a nuclear power station, for example. Uh, and, and, uh, and you can say you don't want nuclear power, and I, I tend to agree with that, but on the other hand, there are many systems like that. And so you have to start to think about organizational forms that can actually address the the nature of the problem that you're looking at, instead of kind of saying, I'm not going to touch that because if you violate horizontality and, and if you're hierarchical, you're a Leninist pig, you know, I mean, I get called that anyway. But so, so you kind of go, this is, this, this is, this is we, 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 need, we need to think through organizational forms uh, that the left are, are, are using. And again, I, I was very impressed with the Chilean students. Uh, I mean, it's very democratic. But they're not frightened of, of leadership. They're not, they're not scared about, uh, about having, having leaders and, and, and leaders' job is to lead. And at the same time, there's a strong control over what leaders can do. So, and this was true also in Bolivia. And, and if you look at what happened in El Alto or something like that, you see all these mixes of hierarchical forms and horizontal forms. So I think we've got to, the left has to think about that and, and be prepared to say, uh, you know, well, let's, let's look at the form, organization of Walmart and it's the efficiency of Walmart in terms of delivering goods. I mean, let's face it, in a socialist society, we would like things to be efficiently run. No? I mean, some things anyway. I mean, other things we might just have fun and not, not worry about the efficiency at all. But other things, I think we'd, we want the sewage disposal to be efficient. And, and, and so things like that, I, I, I think, you know, have to be sort of factored in as to what the alternative... Uh, might look like the fluctuations in the stock market. I think it's all over the place because uh, you know uh, it's it, it's a uh, a lot of it's computer driven, and I, I don't I don't think there's uh, any way in which it's it's easily manipulable. Uh, I think it's just driven by you know all over the place uh, sentiments, although people have organized ways in which they can make money when the stock market goes up and make money if it goes down, which is the genius of, uh, of, of much of, the, of, of the, the, the financial system. Overpopulation. Now, this is very interesting. The problem in, in Europe is not overpopulation. It's lack of population. I mean, the big problem is that they're, 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 they're zero population growth. Now, the answer to that, of course, was to really open the borders to immigration. Uh, and one of the arguments over Turkish accession into the EU is over, well, is that labor supply going to be available? You know, and, and, of course, Turks have already been imported as laborers into Germany anyway. So m many parts of the world, Japan, for example, China's beginning to run into very fast into, into an aging population situation. So one part of the world, again, it's a bit like I mentioned earlier, one part of the world is, 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 is close to zero population growth and the other part is still booming. And if you look at the conditions in the two parts, and you would kind of say there's an obvious relationship between various things that are going on. The single most important thing that would, that, that would have an impact on uh, population growth would be education of women. And, and therefore, the, the women question, women's question is, is, is crucial. If, you, if, if women were, were highly educated and became part of uh, the labor force in, in, in ways, I think the, the population problem would essentially uh, disappear. Uh, and, and interestingly, though, of course, as, as Marx pointed out, a, a surplus population is absolutely necessary for the accumulation of capital. And, and therefore, population growth is something that is often frequently uh, stimulated in, through the dynamics of, 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 of capital accumulation. But there are, 
you know, the population problem is, I'm not saying there's no problem there, I'm saying that actually it's, it's, it, it's connectivity to this dynamics of accumulation uh, is, is, is very specific and needs to be understood uh, as in, in, in terms which, which allow uh, for the gradual reduction of population growth rates, uh, which I think we've seen happening very, very strongly, uh, even in China, uh, but not, of course, in India, so that when you compare those, so there's a lot of variation in, in, in all of that. Okay? All right, I think we're there. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>